Dr. Connell Wiley from our institute. Uh, I just remind you that Dr. Wiley is a professor from the University of Leicester in 2015, working on the absorption lines, variability, and ETR. And now, since 2016, he's been working with Professor Chen on the uh, emission lines in the process. And I think this is also the topic of this talk today. That's right. Okay, thank you, Mikawai. It's um, good to be uh, here and give my first uh, seminar at uh, CFT. Um, so uh, this is work that's um, just been submitted um, for review at Munras. Um, so it's been done in collaboration with uh, uh, my supervisor here, Bojena and Agnieszka, who uh, also works here, but uh, is usually in Krakow, so isn't here very regularly. So um, the talk is going to be about uh, um, MG2 emission in highly inclined quasars. Um, I tried to uh, reference all the figures and images that come from other work uh, in these slides, but I'm not sure where this image comes from. I think it's ESO or something. Uh, <laughs> okay, I know um, most people here aren't uh, astrophysicists. So I'll give um, a brief overview um, of what a, a quasar is. So um, a quasar is a subtype of um, uh, a category of objects called active galactic nuclei. And uh, these are powered by accretion onto um, supermassive black holes. The um, special thing about quasars is, well, in fact, there's a whole zoo of um, AGN subtypes. Quasars are those ones that appear uh, the most luminous and therefore can be seen to the largest distances and therefore redshifts. Um, and therefore they're powered by uh, the largest mass uh, black holes. So in quasars you typically have um, black hole masses uh, between 10 to the 8 and um, 10 to the 10 uh, solar masses. Uh, this can produce a bolometric luminosity, which means the luminosity over the whole spectrum um, from uh, radio to gamma rays. Uh, uh, it just means the sum of the total energy that comes out across the whole wavelength range. It's all, it's all the electromagnetic energy produced by the object. Oh, okay. It's just terminology that you even seen a bolometer and we even use in experiment. Well there must be some some what is the explanation of this? I'm not a historian of the terminology, I'm not sure. Maybe I don't know. It comes from stars uh, anywhere and it's an old somebody invented this having some idea why you call Maybe it was measured volumetrically at the beginning, but now I think but that's yeah. very difficult to measure volumetrically. Oh, <laughs> 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 no, 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 I'm sorry, but, but in particle physics, a volumetric detector is a detector which measures our energy coming out from the source. So that has nothing to do with heat, just energy coming out. Well, I, well, I think, well, I, I'm pretty well, sure. Okay, um, so as I said, the energy output is across um, a very wide range of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, and um, the peak of the energy occurs in um, the far UV portion of the spectrum, which um, uh, is thought to be due to uh, black body emission, which I'll get onto uh, later in the talk. Um, so because they're so luminous, um, they're uh, found at a wide range of uh, cosmological redshifts. Um, this upper limit of 7.09 isn't any sort of and um, that's purely a selection effect, essentially, from the limitation of our instruments. Once uh, um, instruments like uh, the ELT and James Webb uh, 
are operational will probably get um, uh, greater than 10 redshift quasars. Um, also, uh, the lower limit is uh, due to their um, rarity in the universe, essentially. Um, there are uh, lower luminosity AGN, which uh, are closer to the, um, uh, the Milky Way than redshift 0.16, but more luminous objects are rarer, therefore quasars are only found this close. Okay, so this is um, the illustration of the spectral energy distribution um, of quasars. Uh, on this scale, uh, an equal distance on the um, x-axis is equal energy. Um, uh, so uh, you have um, a very flat spectrum uh, from the infrared to the x-ray uh, emission. Um, so there's uh, three different categories here. There's safer galaxies, radio loud and radio quiet quasars. Um, again, this highlights the unification between all types of AGN. So um, safer ga galaxies are in the black solid line. Um, I think in this image, these, these should be um, safer ones probably, yeah, because you can see the um, central engine from the big blue bump. So this big blue bump is due to um, uh, black body emission from the uh, accretion disk. Um, the accretion disk is uh, the very central engine of the, um, of the uh, uh, quasar. Um, this is, uh, it's optically thick and geometrically thin. Um, so it's uh, thought to be of a size of about a few light days. Um, and uh, so there's also these two categories, radio loud and radio quiet. Um, this depends on the uh, synchrotron emission from extended jet structures within uh, the object. Um, so radio quiet objects um, are those that do not have jets um, and the extended lobe structures associated with them, uh, uh, whereas radio loud do, and that causes this orders of magnitude increase in the radio emission at those particular wavelengths. So what can be inferred from that um, and the optical spectrum, which I'll get on to in a moment, is uh, that quasar structure looks approximately like this. Um, you've got, this is the log scale in parsec of distance. Um, you've got this um, optically thick and thin disk surrounding the black hole. Uh, just outside the regions immediately beyond uh, the accretion disk, you have uh, what's known as a broad emission line region. Um, is the so position of the disk Yes, so um, at higher rotating... So it's a curve. So it depends, yes, if you... Um, higher rotation objects will have closer, um, last stable orbits around the... This is a curve. It's thought that uh, in effect all objects will be curve like this. Yes, I, I think you're right, yes, yes. But it also, it depends on the... It depends on the time scale of transfer to the black hole and whether the black hole spins up the accretion disk or the accretion disk spins up the black hole, it's not well known. And it's not my area of expertise, so. But it is a regular black hole. Yes, exactly, yes. Okay. So black holes as white holes. Is not like this. Never mind if it's a point like that. Who cares? 
So the disk, because it's optically thick, um, gives rise to um, a black body radiation, uh, which peaks in the UV. The broad emission line region is um, optically thin, so it produces uh, emission lines. And these lines are broad because they are so close to the black hole, and in fact they are in um, orbital motion around the black hole, and uh, have velocities of tens of thousands of kilometers per second. Um, uh, so they appear as very broad lines, which we'll see in the next slide. Um, there's also this plasma, which is probably magnetically confined um, from the intense magnetic field from the rotating plasma in the accretion disk. And um, these high energy electrons um, inverse Compton scatter uh, photons of UV energies produced by the disk. And this generates uh, higher X-ray and gamma ray energy photons, which are seen from the object. Um, orders of magnitude further out, you have uh, this narrow emission line region. Um, it's also gravitationally bound to the black hole, um, and it's uh, irradiated by the radiation in the accretion disk, as, by the way, is the broad emission line region. With photons. So they produce. So the photons coming off the disk are mostly UV, okay. But we also see from yes, inverse Compton, yes, because so if I go back, you have sorry, um, you have some X-ray emission, okay. But um, this is not being produced by the disk. This is uh, the disk is only producing um, UV photons. But these very high energy electrons are upscattering them to X rays. That makes sense. Um, so you also uh, it's thought that the further right there's this dusty torus, uh, which is quite thick and uh, therefore optically thick, and it produces uh, um, it produces the sorry the infrared region of the spectrum. So each of these regions of the electromagnetic spectrum corresponds to a different region in the, the, the quasar structure. Um, the jet portion is not very well understood what the, um, the mechanism generating the jet is, but um, there's, strong mag there's high velocity particles um, moving at relativistic speeds up to about uh, 0.6 of the speed of light. And, um, the strong magnetic fields uh, produce uh, synchrotron radiation, um, and this generates the radio emission. So this is um, a very famous uh, picture in AGM uh, circles. Um, it uh, describes what's known as the standard model of unification. Um, so as I said before, there's uh, um, a wide range of uh, of types of AGN, um, like quasars and Seifert ones. Um, and this is a simple way of unifying those different types. Um, so it's unified purely by orientation angle, of the viewing angle. Um, so at low inclination, which means a viewing angle close to the axis of the jet, you can see the broad line region you can see the accretion disk producing the continuum emission. Um, and therefore, you see the continuum and broad emission lines in the spectrum. Uh, at uh, high inclination, um, you're going to be looking at into the torus. So all this region in here is obscured. Uh, so uh, this will result in narrow line region sources. Um, this is because, although you cannot see the central parts of the... Excuse me, what, what does it mean, broad lines? So these are these uh, lines close to the... They're gravitationally bound to the black hole. They're very close to the black hole. But these are broad in the sense of spectral? Yes, yes. So and we... it cannot be measured in kilometers per second? Yes, it's just... Uh, because this is the energy. It's just the Doppler shift of the transfer. If you put the, ah, the, the emission line, we have length center, and so then... Yes, so any thermal broadening or anything like that is minuscule in comparison okay. to the... Um, but for someone who doesn't know anything about it, how large is this? 
how large it is. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, what is the size of Okay, so there was a scale on the previous. So it's a bit hard because it's in parsec scale here, but basically this is within a light, a light day, essentially. This is a few light days. And the narrow line region extends up to. So because of there's a big range of black hole masses, it depends on that as well. This is the thing. So um, it, it scales to the half of black hole mass as well. OK. So yeah, the, in terms of scale, this image is a bit misleading because the scale is much, it's more, it's logarithmic on this scale. It's not how this would look. It's just by limitations of uh, display purposes, essentially. Um, so there's some uh, observational evidence for this uh, unification model. Um, we see polarized broad emission lines in type 2 AGM. So type 2 is another name for these ones that are viewed edge on, where you, the central engine is obscured. So in some of these objects, you can see the inner engine, but it's polarized, which means scattering off dust in the outer regions. Um, you also uh, see um, X-ray observers in type 2 objects, more commonly f uh, found than secret ones. Secret ones are the low luminosity relatives of quasars. They're essentially the same phenomena, but at lower luminosity. OK, so uh, I was asking what do you mean by broad lines? This is what the emission line spectrum looks like in quasars. Um, this is a composite uh, made a few years ago. Um, I think there's uh, several thousand quasars that have gone into this. Um, so uh, you get this power law emission, because this is log scale, so a straight line, um, which underlies the uh, ultraviolet emission. So this is in the ultraviolet range here. Um, this is the emission that's coming from the disk around the black hole. Um, further into the red part of the spectrum, um, you have this deviation from the disk power law. And that's expected to be due to um, starlight emission, because typical stars are a few thousand Kelvin. Um, so you don't get much starlight emission in this region, but you do here. This is because, by the way, maybe I didn't say, but very important, these things, as the name suggests, active galactic nuclei, they're found in the centers of galaxies. So you're always going to have um, starlight contribution in the optical spectrum. And how significant that is depends on how luminous the actual core of the AGN is uh, relative to the surrounding starlight. So um, recent studies have looked at um, uh, trying to support this model of quasar unification um, using uh, measurements, direct measurements of inclination. Um, and ways of doing this, uh, most common way of doing this is um, using radio data. Um, so radio emission, this is what a typical quasar looks like uh, in about five gigahertz, or six centimeters, I'm not sure, roughly. Um, uh, you've got a core uh, radio source and you have lobes. So lobes, sometimes you can see the jet connecting to it. Um, this is the jet that was shown earlier in the images. And then when it collides with the interstellar medium, you get these lobe uh, regions um, uh, of strong radio emission. So you can measure inclination. This, what I should say first is this is a source that's viewed almost edge on. So the jet is perpendicular to the accretion disk axis. Um, so in this case, the jet is at 90 degrees. So that would be the inclination angle. 
um, if this was inclined at, say, 10 degrees, then these structures would appear closer to the core region. So if you were to um, look at uh, so the ratio of the core intensity to the uh, lobe and jet intensity, um, you would find that that correlates with inclination, or at least you would think that it would. Okay, um, how do uh, line widths relate to this? So if you uh, think of um, possible structures for the broad line region, it could be uh, like a spherical type structure, it could be confined to a disk if the angular momentum is pushing it outwards. Um, so uh, what we'd like to know is what shape of the what shape does the BLR have and how does this relate to inclination angle? Um, so uh, as I said, this uh, radio ratio is called uh, radio core fraction. Okay, so it's the uh, the ratio of the the core flux to this um, extended uh, jet and lobe structure, and um, uh, so the higher the ratio, uh, the lower the inclination because you will have more of the radio energy concentrated in the core. So a couple of studies have looked at how the spectrum behaves in relation to the radio data. And um, one study shows that uh, the, the width of uh, carbon-4 lines, this is an ultraviolet line at uh, 1,550 angstroms, um, is anti-correlated with this ratio. So as inclination angle increases, um, the width of carbon-4 appears to increase. Um, so another study done recently found something similar. They find um, on another line, MG, uh, MG2, which is a lower ionization state than this one, um, there is um, another, also an anti-correlation which suggests that it's maybe the broad line emitting region is uh, in some sort of disk type structure. Um, so this is important because uh, reverberation mapping of quasars has shown that highly ionized um, radiation is closer to the black hole than lower ionization. So this tells you that uh, uh, you get this behavior in some parts of the high ionization uh, structure and in the lower ionization structure. So, is this inclination uh, defined as an angle between the plane of the disk and the line of sight, or the plane of a disk and the jet it's axis? The, it's, it's, the ax angles. it's the axis of the disk, and therefore it's close to the jet, and the viewing so angle. So you uh, say that the axis of the disk is uh, so if you were looking with the axis of a jet? Yes. It's the same, yeah. so you neglect anything like pre precession? Yes, this is assumed to be smaller than these cases. Right. And um, so the, the inclination angle is zero if you're looking straight down through the jet. That's correct, yeah. Well, it tell, it's not the physics that, it's the, it's the structure, it tells you about the structure, because in, the, in these type 2 objects, as I said before. So at different angles you will see different structures. Yeah, there's hundreds of thousands of these. Yeah, so you can do a statistical study, yes, yes. Yes, that's correct, yes. So you can use statistical studies to find the structure. We see many of them. Yes. 
I think with the Sloan Digital Sky Server we have 100,000, so that's pretty good. <laughs> Is that enough? <laughs> Um, so, um, but in any case, I would like to know if it's true that by measuring this, because for each of the galaxy, if there is somewhere a galaxy, even if there are millions, billions, or two billions, and even trillions of those galaxies and whoever, that for each of them, this angle is a specific property of yes. that galaxy. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. It has. It does. It has. Is it working? Yes, I am looking because galaxies have different meaning. No, but let's not. May I say something which is simpler? Let's have just one object. Yes. We have a line width measured in that object. Now, the question is, is this line width telling us something about the source luminosity or about the viewing angle? Because in both cases, if you have lower luminosity, you have narrower line. And then if you change the viewing angle, you also can have narrower line. So you have two things, lumi intrinsic luminosity and line width, which give the same effect. It would be nice to disentangle them. Viewing angle. Yes. Viewing angle and absorption luminosity. So as further support for this uh, model of uh, increasing uh, line width with the uh, um, inclination angle. Um, the question is that you are trying to tell me that if I take a picture of a night highway with all possible directions of the lights of a car going on it, facing me, then I can, from analysis of this light, tell a maker of the car. No, I can What is the structure of your speed? The speed, the speed, the speed of the speed. Yeah, but that's on the... the, the that's, <laughs> yeah, probably. That's not the property of, the, of, the, of, the, of that object. Of it's, it's how fast it's it goes. No, it's but not many cars... It's the set of this object. Yeah, the, yeah but, but there are yeah, many, many cars which can go at the same speed. So what? And the speed of a car doesn't tell anything about the car. But if we blow up the car, then out of the whole endeavor we can say something. No, yes. I mean, because there are speed limits. Uh, we, we know that there is a higher speed limit. Okay, as further support for this, uh, there's a second um, measure it, for a measuring inclination. It's uh, the ratio of the radio uh, strength to the uh, visible. Um, so this idea is that... Um, Okay, so if you have, you can see the visible luminosity of the object, then um, you can uh, use this ratio with the radio luminosity to measure the inclination angle. And both of these, both the radio core fraction and the ratio to visible, uh, show a, a trend towards um, higher width of the line, as you would expect the uh, inclination angle to trend with these particular ratios. Uh, Okay, so there's not just evidence for this broadening of lines at um, high inclination from radio data, but there's also from optical data as well. Um, so this uh, O3 emission, these brackets mean that it's uh, a forbidden line, so um, it is uh, collisionally de-excited um, in high density regions, so it can only exist in the extended narrow line region that I was showing earlier. Um, so because it's uh, a very spatially extended region, uh, the emission is uh, 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 
almost isotropic. Um, so uh, the equivalent width measure of it, um, the equivalent width is uh, basically the ratio of the line strength to the continuum strength, um, is thought to get larger with um, increasing inclination angle. This is because as you increase, if I go back to the plot, might make it clearer. So um, as you increase the inclination angle, you will s start seeing the disk emission less as it's obscured by this dust. But the narrow region, which is much more extended, will still be visible. You'll still see this emission the same no matter what inclination angle you're at. So studies have been done on this, and it indeed it is true that uh, the width of the H beta line um, increases uh, with uh, the equivalent width of this uh, forbidden um, oxygen three line. Um, so the, again, this supports uh, the idea in the quasar population of the broad lines coming from something which is um, a relatively flattened disk, flattened enough so that you can see uh, faster velocities um, uh, in the plane of the disk, if that makes sense, because you will see projection of the velocity uh, towards the line of sight in that case. Okay, um, if you uh, think of this, this is a vis more visible representation of uh, what this uh, theory is. Um, so at zero inclination, you're looking straight down toward along the disk. Imagine this is the the radio uh, jet, and this is the broadline region. If you're looking at 90 degrees into the broadline region, you're going to see a wide spread in velocities, because uh, here there's going to be zero velocity in your line of sight, whereas at the edges is going to be maximal velocity uh, along the line of sight. In this case, everything is in the plane of the disk, which is at 90 degrees to your viewing angle. Therefore you should see very um, narrow lines. But, but you seem to connect velocity with broadening, but broadening is not the measure of velocity, but of... Difference. But there's a range of velocities. Yeah. Yeah. Velocity. Yeah. So one yeah. velocity does not tell you anything about it. Width. Well, the, the, it's the width of the line. When I talk about the velocity of the line, I mean the width of the line. Exactly. And this the velocity is just a shift. Yes, but if, you, if you're looking like this, you will see both the edge of the disk and the center of the disk. But there's so if no the line is narrow, that means that most velocities are the same. Yes, which well, would be more like this case, because it's all projected at 90 degrees to the line of sight. If that makes sense. Okay, so again, this supports the broad emission line region being in the flattened geometry because of the relationship between the intrinsic velocity which is what it's actually moving at, and the observed velocity, which is dependent on the inclination angle theta. Okay, so I'll get on now to the uh, research that we've actually done. So um, we uh, used a sample of uh, quasars uh, uh, that was selected previously uh, a few years ago. Um, so these were, um, quasars that are double lobed. So in the previous um, picture here, they all looked something like this. So they are at relatively edge on inclinations. Okay, and I got these from radio surveys and um, so, and as I said, they are uh, in the, where the radio emission is dominated by these lobes, uh, indicating that they're edge on viewing angles. And um, so they calculated the inclination angles using Doppler beaming. So this is just when uh, the closer lobe will appear brighter, uh, just purely from the Doppler effect. And um, so these objects are quite rare that have double lobes. So they're an inter interesting case to study. Um, 
particularly because in the unified model, um, highly inclined objects which show broad emission lines should not exist because in that case you should be looking through the dusty torus. So there's a small number of these, 1.7% of quasars, that are apparently at high inclinations, but you can see the central parts of the, um, the quasar, which is um, something of a puzzle. Um, so uh, this was originally conceived as um, a project to uh, compare giant quasars with uh, smaller ones. Giant ones are just uh, defined as being uh, having this radio structure that's greater than 0.7 megaparsec. And um, they find no basic difference, so we could use the whole sample uh, as our uh, statistical test bed uh, for our investigations using spectroscopy. So um, this is a bit boring slide, but ignore everything apart from the, this column here. So if you can see that, they're all very high inclinations. The average uh, that you calculate from that is about 73 degrees. Um, some previous studies have suggested that uh, the central features of quasars should not be visible above 60 degrees. Um, so there's something strange going on with these objects. Okay, so we're back to like these, um, these very large statistics that we need to uh, carry out this. Um, which are provided by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, so it's easy to select objects as being uh, lobe dominated or giant or wherever you want because there's just so many of these objects. So even if they're rare, they can be seen easily. So this is uh, the main telescope of the Sloan Digital Sky Survey um, at Apache Point Observatory. It's a two meter uh, telescope that uh, scans the sky with um, using these plates and these plates have uh, optic fibers plugged into them and the optic fibers then correspond to um, positions on the sky of uh, objects that are to be surveyed. So this goes on, I think, most nights. So, um, and it's been going on since 2000, I think. So they have, this is why they have so many objects. What makes magnesium so special here? You have lines of magnesium and oxygen, right? So the, the useful thing about magnesium about is... Magnesium appears a lot in these. <laughs> magnesium appears a lot in this particular survey, because um, when you redshift this line by the uh, this, the sensitivity that this telescope is sensitive to, then you find magnesium in the optical part of the spectrum. So if the redshift is one, then it's going to be shifted from the ultraviolet to the optical. Because this is just one convenient. It's a very, it's purely convenient, yes, 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 and it tells you about then this uh, low ionization state of the broad line region. Um, so from this original study, we selected those objects that have the MG2 broad line in the ultraviolet, red shifted to the optical in our frame of reference, and this then gave us a total uh, sample of 45. Okay, so um, now I get on to the modeling of the spectrum um, of these quasars. So uh, it's in, this is actually quite difficult to do because it's in a complex region um, of the spectrum. Um, so in addition to the magnesium line itself, you've got the power law disk continuum. Um, you've also got uh, the broad line using Balmer continuum. So this is just generated by free bound electrons uh, recombine to the ground state. Uh, so you get a continuum of emission uh, uh, beyond the, uh, the Lyman limit. Um, but, uh, but I'm still extremely puzzled. Suppose you do all your procedure, which will now come, which I would be anyway unable to follow. What, can, can, how do I learn anything about the physics of, of, of the inside of this anything source? So the, giving us enormous amount of data, which are completely alien to me, right? This is not a seminar for experts on this topic. Mm -hmm. You start to behave like those journalists in, in TV who say that they are proud, they always have 
negative from man. This is unacceptable. <laughs> if you don't understand, try to learn. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. No, you are objecting. You are no, trying to blindly object to everything which is said here. I'm trying to I oppose to that. But don't, don't shout. You must be Don't sure. shout, that's let's no, start let, with. Let's say something yeah, never quiet. Mind, never mind. We want to learn physics, but to, in order to learn physics, we need to learn geometry. Yes. Because those are coupled. And this is the way to determine geometry. And actually, the result we got is quite uh, uh, the size surprising. The geometry of the source. The, the orientation, 3D. 3D. We see one spectrum, and from one spectrum, we want to know the three d structure. Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's the... <laughs> um, so, there's uh, this Barmer continuum, you've got uh, um, a pseudo continuum it's uh, um, of Fe2 lines, because they come from the broad line region, but they're all broadened, and if you know anything about the atomic structure of um, iron, it's very complex. There's uh, something like 800 lines there. So um, this forms a, a continuum in this region as well. So um, it's a complex region to fit, so it underwent the following procedure. So first of all, in here, between these two uh, blue vertical lines is the, um, the small blue bump, where you have the iron and the um, Balmer continuum. And within here, you have the magnesium line. So first of all, outside this, to avoid contamination from it, we fit uh, power law to line-free regions, in this particular example, to, so that we can get the underlying power law within the region that sits above the power law. Okay, so um, once that's done, you can subtract the power law and then in the spectral range of the small blue bump, you can uh, fit uh, the Fe2 emission. So Fe2 is broadened, so we uh, used uh, grid points on a chi-square minimization routine um, of a broadening range between zero and 3,000 kilometers per second in steps of 1,000. Um, there were also free parameters from the Balmer continuum. Uh, the flux at the Balmer edge, it was allowed to vary between 1 and 100%. Is Balmer edge the same as ionization? So the Balmer edge um, is uh, the... Um, uh, what is the Balmer edge? Um, so it's, it's the, um, the point where the Balmer continuum uh, rises. Um, no, because this is, that would be the Lyman edge. The, this is the Balmer edge. This is 